I don't know if you care for television, but you're probably aware that some of the best work now in what used to be called cinema is being done for television. And top actors are, are mad to get into some of these series. Have you come across a series called Better Called Saul? Yeah, which it came after Breaking Bad, but it it's re, it's acts as a prequel. Uh, fantastic performance by Bob Odenkirk um, of a, a, an utter sleazebag of a lawyer. Now, he's not. I'm not suggesting all lawyers are sleazebags. He is. <laughs> but he's not an utter sleazebag either. He's quite a complex character. But he, he ends up being one of those lawyers who goes so far out on the edge that he ends up in very, very shady territory indeed, dealing with very frightening people. At the beginning, <clears throat> he ends up in a row with, um, with a terrifying gangster called Tuco, a drug dealer, an absolute psychopath. And he has, he has unknowingly, he has got himself into this corner because he and two associates were trying to play a trick, a confidence trick on Tuco's, aunt, on Tuco's grandmother. And it went wrong and he caught them. So he takes them out to the desert with his associates and he's going to shoot the three of them. Now he's a complete nutter. So Saul, as he later becomes, persuades him not to shoot him. Yeah? Not to shoot him. And, and he persuades him. He talks him down. He persuades him. He has this strangely priestly gesture with his hands. He keeps going like this at Tuco to, you know, to calm him down. And then he argues that he shouldn't shoot his associates, who are terrified. Okay? And he, with great difficulty, persuades them. And so the deal is that, well, instead of that, they get both their legs each broken. So he argues with them again, and he, he gets them down, and he gets down to one leg each. <laughs> the sentence is carried out on screen, and the sensibilities of the audience are not respected. Okay. That's the priest. No, not the gangster. <laughs> That's the priest. If a priest isn't willing to do that, we have problems. Okay. One of our priests did it some years, a long time ago, actually. Uh, he was a very holy man. He gave a character witness to a, a complete thug uh, in, the, in the local court. The local newspaper gleefully rang with a headline a, a week later, uh, he, he called him, speaking to the judge, a heavenly man. The local newspaper reported, heavenly man, in inverted commas, gets two years for vicious assault. <laughs> and a lot of priests would have loved to strangle that priest. <laughs> but was he entirely wrong? I know there's a problem with priests giving character references in court. Was he entirely wrong? Are we not supposed to be at that stuff? Are we not supposed to end up being laughed at because we've spoken for people from, for whom nobody else would speak? I mean, do you not have, a, do you not have a, a pattern, a continual pattern in the Old Testament of intercession? Is that not embodied in our Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, just, just look at the Old Testament. Look at Abraham. Look at Abraham bargaining and huckstering in Pierce's term with God to get Sodom off the hook. That's very powerful. And that tremendous line, Abraham still stood before the Lord. That's an incredible thing to do, is to stand your ground before the name, as the Hasidic Jews call him. They won't pronounce the name, the unpronounceable name. To stand before him and go, yeah, but if there are 50 good men in there, I mean, you wouldn't kill the 50, and, and so on down. And it's a ridiculous kind of a traditional bargaining scene. And yet, <clears throat> it tells something powerful about God and powerful about the call of those who, whose vocation is, is to, to intercede, to advocate, to argue for, to be the counsel for at the mercy seat. And then you have Moses. And we're told at the end of Deuteronomy that there never again would be a prophet like Moses in Israel whom the Lord knew face to face. It's an incredible line, face to face. Can you imagine for a Jew of that time the notion of being face to face 
with the unnameable. And then, of course, you have Jeremiah, and then you have Ezekiel. And you have those tremendous lines in Ezekiel, spoken by the deity. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land. Who will treat with me? Who will speak for this wretched person? Who will speak for this country? Who will speak for Zion? That traitor, that betrayer who has broken the covenant with me. Who will speak? Who will stand up in the breach? Incredible line which resonates with Irish people with the poetic image of the, the gap of danger. Who will stand in it? I put it to you that that's every Christian. But I put it to you that ministerially it is the priest. That is the priest's business to continually argue the case before God for his parishioners. The Cure d'Ar never stopped praying. And by the way, most priests are afraid of John Vianney, and I'm terrified of him. Okay, and he's our patron saint, patron saint of parish priests, isn't he? Yeah. No, I'm terrified of him. Okay. Teeth or no teeth. Okay. <laughs> And, and he, 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 he constantly prayed, convert my parish, convert my parish. He kept praying for his parish the whole time. That's, that's what we are at. The mediator is our Lord Jesus Christ. But ministerially, we carry it out in his name and persona Christi. And most centrally, the priest does it at the altar. That's a, I, I never cease... And I'm, easily, I'm as easily distracted as any other priest. I never cease to be awed at what I do at the altar. And let me assure you, a lot of the pride that was in that at the beginning has long since burned out of me. I've come to know myself. I, don't, I have no right to be there. Okay. If you were recruiting, which is something I want to mention again, if you were recruiting, you wouldn't be recruiting the likes of me. I'm a traitor. I'm a mediocre priest. I'm fourth rate. But here's the thing. If you're really stuck and you need a fairly shady lawyer <laughs> to argue your case, may I give you my slightly grubby card <laughs> where you can look me up? Because I, even I, who wouldn't have the right to stand in the same town as John Vianney, even I can stand at the altar for you. Even I can raise my hands to the deity for you. Always for you. It does not happen except in reference to you. Even I can call him down on the altar and he will come for you. Now I know it's not liturgically, that, you know, you don't talk like that anymore. The priest calling down, you know, it's a bit, Az, bit Aztec. Okay. No, you, you, do, you don't do that anymore. I'm from the west of Ireland. We love drama. Okay. No, no, I want a bit of razz. Uh, I have Father Declan Hurley to thank, who's present here today, doesn't know I have him to thank, for introducing me to von Balthasar's biography of Therese of Lisieux, and also for, therefore, enabling me to pretentiously quote von Balthasar <laughs> at a conference but I was genuinely bowled over with a point that he made. He talks about how Therese is actually quite different in her spirituality. This, this girl who had no particular formation in theology, and uh, most of her reading, it was excellent reading, but it was very basic. You know, it wasn't hardly a theology degree. She read the Gospels and she read the Imitatio, the, the Imitation of Christ, a campus. You couldn't read better. But generally, to know theology, you'd be expected to read out further. Um, she did what many didn't quite do before her. They thought of the contemplative life as something you did. It was, it was very individual. You, you know, God transformed you. You had the conversio morum, the metanoia, the whole thing. And for many of them, you built up, as Bernard of Clairvaux said, you, you filled the cisterns the cisterns of grace, and then you, you were energized and you were strong for the apostles. No, 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 she didn't quite do that. She saw the prayer, 
the intercession as the apostolate. She went in before the Blessed Sacrament to do damage, rolling up her sleeves. She was doing apostolate, not praying for the apostolate. She was doing that too. She was doing apostolate when she went into Mass. She was doing apostolate when she prayed. She intended to keep doing it after she died and to let down the, the famous shower of roses. And von Balthasar, when, and I know none of you are going to dare to argue with him. Okay, so that's why I'm belting you with it. <laughs> but I think it's a brilliant point. Von Balthasar reckoned that she was genuinely new in that respect is that while something similar had been done or said in the past, nobody had been as barefaced about it. She joined the Carmel to convert the world. Isn't that a fascinating thought? Now, it's not 100 miles away from what other people had thought they were doing for centuries, but the slight difference is telling. Okay? The centre of the priest's mission is prayer. And I'm saying that to you as somebody who has a fractured, difficult history with prayer. Okay, so I'm not going to... Uh, there are plenty of people here who, who can fill you in on that anyway. I'm not going to pretend to be anywhere near perfect on this. Okay, I'm very far from it. But I'm telling you that with sad self-knowledge. The centre of it is prayer. It is, the priest is at the core of this. He is at the centre of the nuclear reactor when he offers the Mass for the people, including and especially those who don't deserve it. There should be a special line, and I wouldn't put it past Pope Francis to do it, there should be a special line in the Mass, and for all scumbags, all <laughs> <laughs> Because we have to get our heads around the fact. Now here, I may scandalize some of you just a little, and you, you may be a little annoyed with me, but I have to make this point. I really have to make this point. Unless we can pray, not just the priest, because all Christians do this in a sense. The priest does it ministerially. Unless we can pray for the worst malefactors, the, 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 the most wicked, unless we can pray for drug pushers and those who destroy. Like how many people in the country are praying for the Kinans? How many people in our country are, pr playing, are praying for the, for the people who are at the core of a lot of the, the, the trouble that's going, on, that's going on with drugs? How many of us are praying for these people? Therese did. Every priest should be, at, you know, every so often, if, if he can get a mass to spare, he should offer the mass for the most notorious criminal in Mount Joy, for their conversion. Who else is going to do this? Who's going to stand in the breach before God? Who's going to go face to face, eyeball to eyeball with God? The priest is to do it, not because he's better than you, in fact, if anything, he's going to, if, he, if he's half decent at all, he's going to be absolutely shaken to the core at how inferior he is to so many of his people as he gets to know his faith better and his God better. But the priest must do this. No, all of us, but ministerially the priest must do this. And for the rapists and for the child molesters, they must be prayed for, their souls are invaluable, which is to say they are indispensable and invaluable because we do not get to change our own worth. God has set it. The matter is sealed in Christ's blood. The matter is dealt with. We don't get to change it. I remember watching people at home. My father has a small shop and uh, one, our local politician, now oh, he was a great man. He died a few years ago there. He was like a southern sheriff, you know. And the, <laughs> he was a really great character. But he was a master of local politics. And he'd be there and people would come in, you know. He'd be there, some of people would come in and they whisper to him and he'd whisper, whisper, whisper back. And he'd kind of have an impromptu clinic maybe there. And, and his, like, like he was, in, he was, he was in a master of taking chances. But his job was getting things done for people. There's a very powerful scene in Sorrentino's film, Il Divo, I don't know if you've seen it, on the, the, uh, the political career of Giulio Andreotti, the remarkably complex prime minister of Italy. But uh, it shows Andreotti, who's a, you know, one of the most famous men in Italy, conducting his clinic 
on a Sunday afternoon. And they're bringing him in. You know, these are... Actually, it's very powerful. Because these are very poor people. They have a lot of problems. And they're coming to see their, 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 local, their local politician. And, of course, he's also the prime minister. And they're bringing him little gifts. They're bringing him a rabbit. You know, they're bringing him, you know, bits of, you know, some cheese or some... And he's, he's there. This is one of the most famous politicians in Europe. And he's going, oh, the, the rabbit. I didn't know they, they, they were that big. Where, where, where was he? Where is he from? They're telling him and how they fed him and this kind of thing. And he's, that's us. I'm hopeless at this, OK, personally. But I'm telling you sincerely, that's us. It makes or break on us. It goes to its core in the mass, but it radiates out. Now, you can't recruit these people. You can tempt them down from the mountains with hunks of raw meat, but you can't recruit them. They're there already. As was said very well earlier, they are there already. We have to try. You can't separate this from evangelization because to get to them, they're completely unevangelized. There are people out there with, with, with genuine vocations to be the intercessors, to be the, the endless sleazy lawyer, to be the endless arguer, the endless advocate. They're out there. They're crucially needed, and they don't know it. They may not even know God or know Christ. So evangelization is indispensable. And within that, the vocational work. This is entirely a work of self-interest. We need these people. And I say we because... I need people to pray for me, and I need priests to pray for me. We need them. And I, I, I beg you, I'm not going back to some, uh, to, to an outdated approach that is not doctrinally necessary or warranted, where the priest, you know, was sort of up there. It was, that was very much in some ways more pronounced anyway in poorer areas, I think, to be honest, where the middle classes weren't as strong. You know, we had a very, very small bourgeoisie after the, after independence, and the priests just filled the gap, like, to an extent, you know? Um, I, I don't want to go back to any of that. I just know that I should be at the altar praying for them, and that somebody must do it, and we must do it. Um, I, I can't emphasize to you too strongly the importance of this. Now, the concept of the parish may be changing, this is very interesting. It was very hard to know whether the parish as a, as, a, as a physical circumscription is going to continue to be so central. Okay? And, and that remember um, uh, His Excellency Archbishop Fisichella's comment at the beginning about how absolutely the novum that this is. It's new. This is a new culture. It's unprecedented. Okay? So we don't know what form the parish will take. Will parishes in the future... Uh, be kind of the congregation that attends a particular church because people now move and they go to whatever church they like. I don't know. I don't know. But I know that this, this service of the priest to the people, which involves also his somehow knowing them, okay, or getting to know them, even if that involves an act of imagination because many of them may not wish him to visit their house. Okay. This is absolutely crucial. I remember... Uh, 1984, I was out in the States on a J-1. Uh, an uncle of mine was a priest there, and he helped me to get a few summer jobs. And uh, <clears throat> I was very friendly with a young fella, um, a bright guy. And we were the same age. We were waiting on tables in the same restaurant. And never met him again. He, he went on to... He'd just finished his degree in college, and he was going on to study law. I think maybe he had mentioned uh, Georgetown which I think is a very good law school. So he was going on to law there. And uh, some, many years later, I was talking to my uncle. And I said, do you ever meet young Smith, let's call him, <laughs> OK? Do you ever meet him? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, yeah, he's a very successful lawyer. And my uncle's comment was, ah, that guy, he said, he's a chancer, but he's got guts. And he said, he'll take chances for his client. He said, he's a real lawyer from his heart. You know, he'll nearly get himself in jail for his client. And I thought, you know, because I remembered the guy, and he was no joke, and he was well capable of, of going into the shadier side of life. He was very talented, very bright, very charismatic. But I remember thinking, 
in its own way, it was a beautiful tribute. It was an incredible tribute that he would, that he would be so devoted to his client. I mean, it's problematic, but it was a remarkable tribute. Now, I'm saying, how many of us priests are like that? Is that we'd nearly, you know, we'd nearly get ourselves in trouble for our parishioners. Okay? Or how willing... Okay, let me finish like this. Do you know something? All these scandals we've had in some ways, and I'm not diminishing the seriousness of what happened at all, okay? Not at all. God can work with anything. He can even work with evil, although he does not will evil. He permits it, but he can work with it. He often does work with it. Probably all the time is somehow working alongside it or, or in consequence of it or whatever. Ultimately, this is nearly incomprehensible to us. I think if one good thing has come out of these scandals, it has cut off our retreat into the middle classes, into middle class respectability and into oblivion. We would have been lost. Because as the church diminished and diminished, we'd have wanted to be loved and to be picked up and hugged. Yeah, yeah to be, please be nice to me. Yeah, I'm only a little priest. Yeah. No, no, I can, I can see this happening. I could see this. I'm sorry, I could see it happening. Okay, it would be our response to a big world which is no longer controllable by us. Yeah? And, and remember, loss of status is genuinely traumatic. People who, who say, oh, there's the priests, it's just they've lost their, their big standing and now, now they're, to, you know, they're, they're not happy. You know? Let's say that with the respect it deserves. We're social animals. You lose your status, it's like concussion or brain damage. It's hugely traumatic. No, but I mean, let's say, let's say you're a business person and you lose your good name. Sure, you're, you're panjaxed. You know, the, 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 the consequence of the social loss is enormous. I think it could be, God forgive me, okay, I'm not justifying anything that happened, but that could be a good thing because we are not respectable. Hilary Mantel, the novelist, said lately, it got Lord of mercy on her, she died lately, she couldn't stand us. Um... Yeah, she was, she was brought up a Catholic, but couldn't stick it. Very Catholic attitude, actually. <laughs> One of my favourite quotations, and I love her books, okay, I hate it. She did a job on St. Thomas More that only the devil could have done better. Uh, she really did do a job on him in, in, in the Wolf Hall novels. Um, and actually made a hero at Thomas Cromwell, which would take plastic surgery nearly. <laughs> but she did it. Catholicism, she said, is not a religion for respectable people. And I thought, and as, what a backhanded compliment. <laughs> what a wonderful backhanded compliment. So we're not a religion for those who decide that they will follow only the mores of the time, only conventional morality, and will rot back like compost into the earth as if they had never been there. No, we will be disagreeable, dissatisfied, awkward, greedy, shifty, curious, rebellious. Jumber Joyce's famous phrase, the mutinous Shannon waves. Mutinous, great line, right? Like my Irish terrier at home, mutinous. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will not be respectable. We will only ask for God's love and God's approval. Now, if this thing can produce that in us, it would be a tremendous outcome from evil and a tremendous defeat for evil. And so I ask you, as we recruit priests, which you can't do, as I said, but you know what I mean, you have to use words. As we try to reach these people who have this vocation, perhaps I could suggest an advertisement, a job description. Uh, wanted, intelligent, uh, lively, uh, energetic, uh, slightly amoral, mildly sociopathic, <laughs> definitely sleazy, ambitious young man <laughs> who wants to do something absolutely extraordinary and feels he has it in him from the beginning. Consider that God may be asking you to stand in front of him in a dodgy Macintosh 
with a battered briefcase and a disreputable slouch hat and argue a case for some of the most frightening people that you can imagine because nobody else will do it. Consider that you are called to do that. Now, I say to you, there's only one thing you should keep saying in the course of any trial, they say, when you're starting out as a young lawyer, and that's what we should be doing at the court of heaven. Objection! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>